So I want to talk briefly about the creation, the living part of the creation, uh, otherwise known in science as biological diversity. And it really is quite extraordinary if you just stop and look and listen to it. Uh, all the way from some extraordinary bird like a harpy eagle in the Amazon forest and to microorganisms in the soil. Uh, and the living part of the planet is the most sensitive part to climate change. Uh, there is absolutely nowhere you can go on this planet and not see the fingerprints of climate change, not only on physical systems like the ghastly glacial lake incident Vandana told us about, but in the life cycles, uh, in the locations of plant and animal species. And we already can see sort of foreshadowing what happens if we actually go all the way to the two degree target, uh, that it would be a world without tropical coral reefs. Uh, we're already seeing the coniferous forests of Western North America with the balance tipped by global warming in favor of the bark beetles so that essentially 70% of the trees in them are gone. Uh, and yet, it's this extraordinary variety, this beauty, this wonder, uh, which actually supported the emergence of human civilization. And when Arrhenius wrote his famous paper demonstrating the greenhouse effect in 1896, he was really answering the question, why is the Earth a habitable temperature for humans and other forms of life? Why isn't it too cold? So that is exactly what we're playing with today, and it will have immense implications for humanity, uh, which basically makes climate change the greatest environmental justice issue of all time. Not only at the, at the current moment, but because of its implications for future generations. So when one when, when is forced to look at the challenge so severely, uh, one is forced to look for solutions uh, that can actually make a difference at scale. And the extraordinary thing is that the biology of this planet can help us a very great deal. Uh, it can't solve everything uh, because we burn a lot of fossil fuels, which actually is old biology that we're burning. Uh, but there is a sufficient amount of excess CO2 in the atmosphere from centuries of ecosystem destruction and degradation that if there was a concerted effort at scale to restore ecosystems, there's literally something like half a degree or 0 0.6 degrees of potential climate change that we can take out of actually happening. Uh, and that actually means we have to start recognizing that this planet works as a combined physical and biological system. Uh, that it is, in fact, a living planet. And the sensible thing for us to do is to respect that and try and manage ourselves so, in a sense, we are effectively managing that system. Uh, so that is my sort of ultimate quixotic dream uh, as to where we should go. Uh, and the wonderful thing is when you do that, there are all kinds of ancillary benefits. You know, reforestation brings all kinds of ecosystem services like the watershed that provides this wonderful water for New York City. Uh, restoring degraded grasslands and grazing lands also makes it possible to do more grazing. Uh, restoring agroecosystems 
in the sense that Vandana was just describing it, uh, so that they accumulate carbon instead of leaking carbon, you get more soil fertility. Uh, and the same with coastal wetlands. So I think if we can sort of draw back from the immediate details that distract us every day and think about that living system, uh, think about our responsibility, realize that inherent in this is the capacity of every individual to make a difference, uh, to plant a tree, to help restore a wetland. Uh, it's a little bit like the Victory Garden effort uh, in the Second World War. Everybody can contribute to this and make a better future for humans and other forms of life. Thank you.